Today on Windows on the World, I'll be talking to author and researcher Ralph Ellis, who has written 10 books researching both the New and the Old Testament. His latest book, The Grail Cipher, reveals that the mythical King Arthur story was modelled upon the life of Jesus and was the work of the Templar Knights. Have you ever wondered how and why King Arthur is missing from the archaeological record? And from much of the historical record too? Well now we know why. Building upon the evidence uncovered in the King Jesus trilogy, Ralph explains that Arthurian history is actually based upon Gospel history. The history of King Arthur was modelled upon the life of Jesus, that Jesus or Arthur had 12 disciple knights of the round or the last supper table, the son of Jesus was the king of Palmyra in Syria. This is the most comprehensive and radical assessment of Arthurian history ever undertaken. The conclusion is that the classical Arthur did not exist. This is why there is no mention of King Arthur for nearly 600 years until the early 12th century. It was only when the Templar Crusaders returned to Normandy from Syria and Judea that the Arthurian genre was born. Why? Because in reality King Arthur was the alter ego for the Biblical King Jesus of Judea. The Templar Crusaders had discovered a manuscript in Syria detailing the true monarchical and martial life of King Jesus and his family. But this revised history was decidedly heretical and positively dangerous. Being unable to record and preserve this history directly, the Norman Templars crafted an alternate pseudo-history about a British monarch called King Arthur. So, Ralph Ellis, welcome to Windows on the World. Thanks very much for having me. Yes, this is my favourite topic, is, is challenging people with fixed ideas. So, yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, your books <laughs> certainly do that, and your research is incredibly intensive, and I find your work very interesting. The last interview we did was on uh, King Jesus or King Isis of Edessa, which was fascinating and your work can be found um, on the website. Do you want to give the website now? Yeah, the uh, my um, website is Edfu Books, so that's E-D-F-U hyphen books dot com. Uh, there's a bit of information there, um, but I normally use my uh, website, uh, sorry, website, my Facebook site, which is uh, Ralph Ellis 144, um, which uh, I've just realized is quite interesting because it's um, <laughs> it's the name of Percival's father. I didn't realize that. There we go. Um, in, in Arthurian history, the, the father of Percival was called uh, Alan Lee Gross, and the Gross is 144, of course. And he was called 144 because he was the 12 of the 12 the 12th of the 12 disciples. So, yeah, there's a good introduction. <laughs> well, hopefully that's going to whet people's appetite because um, a lot of this numerological significance, significance goes into um, astrotheology, which, which I think is a big part of what your research is about. Yeah, um, I, I started off obviously researching uh, Egyptian history and tying it in with the Old Testament. So all of my, I've written 10 books on this, so it's, it's quite extensive. Uh, all of the first books were on the sort of Old Testament, tying in the Old Testament with Egyptian history, because that's where I think it all came from. I mean, that's obviously where the Israelites came from, but I think they were actually the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt, which is what Joseph Flavius says, the, the um, first century uh, Jewish historian, he actually says that. Um, and then I went on to the New Testament story and, and uh, did the same there, because the problem is the, the problem is the Arthurian problem that all these people are missing from the historical record. So, you know, you can go from the very start of, of, of Genesis with Adam and Eve and then you can go through to, you know, Joseph and Isaac and um, Moses and all the way through to King Solomon and King David and then through to Jesus and Saul and all the rest of them. All of these characters are missing from the historical record. And King Arthur as well, of course, and we'll go through that in a minute. And how can this be? It can't be. Well, there's only a couple of things it can be. Either it's all fictional, which, you know, some people say, you know, it's all been made up. Uh, the entire... Uh, Old and New Testament has all been fabricated. And some people, of course, will say the same about Arthurian history because there is no King Arthur. So it's all been invented. It's fictional. Or the other option is that we're looking in the wrong location or the wrong era. And what I've done is go back through uh, Old Testament history and I've found all the Old Testament characters. 
uh, mainly through changing the era and the location of where they were. So, you know, I found the tombs of King David and King Solomon by moving their capital city from uh, Zion, which is Jerusalem, of course, to Zoan. And it's spelled the same in, in Hebrew because Hebrew doesn't have um, any, um, any vowels. So by moving the capital city from Zion to Zoan, I found their tombs because Zoan is in Egypt and people have been looking in the wrong location. And with the New Testament story, I found the Jesus character, and we went through this last time in, in uh, my book, uh, Jesus, uh, King of Odessa. I found the Jesus character by looking in a different era, because what the scribes have done is they didn't want this Jesus character involved in something like the um, Jewish revolt, which was the AD 70s. And so they moved him back into the AD 30s when you know things were more peaceable, and then you could have your pauper prince of peace. So they moved his history by 40 years, which is why you can't find his history if you sit there looking in the early first century. But if you look in the late first century, all the information is there. The character is there. So that's the I wrote on Old and New Testament history. But while I was going through all of this, I kept coming across snippets of information which were decidedly Arthurian. And, and so it got me more and more, because I didn't know a great deal about Arthurian history at that time, and it got me more and more interested in the Arthurian story. And, um, yeah, lo and behold, of course, we have the same problem with Arthur. He is missing from the historical record. Um, so, and, and, you know, listeners might not be familiar with that because they've, you know, they've watched the television, they've read the histories, and they know there is a King Arthur. But he's not there. He's not there in the archaeological record, and he's not there in the literary record either. Um, so if we go through some of these early manuscripts, um, the, the first was by Gildas, who lived at the time. He was a Dark Age uh, chronicler, and Gildas never mentions King Arthur, which is a bit strange, really, considering he was supposed to be the most powerful, wealthy, and influential king of that era, and Gildas doesn't mention him. Strange that, isn't it? And then we go on to the uh, Venerable Bede. He's uh, a little bit later, 8th century, and Bede does not mention King Arthur. So, you know, we're supposed to have this very famous monarch who, who was ruling somewhere, perhaps on the Welsh borders or whatever. Um, really influential. Everybody knew about him, but the chroniclers don't mention him at all. And then we come on to Nennius. Nennius, this is 9th century, does not mention King Arthur. He mentions a uh, Dux Bellorum, a, a, uh, a warlord called Arthur, but I mean, the, by no means is, is that the classical King Arthur, you know, with his royal court at Camelot and all of the characters we know, you know, the Guinevere's, the Lancelot's, the Percival's, the Sir Galahad's. None of that exists within Nennius. Um, so we, we've come through to the 9th century, then we come on to the early 12th century with William of Malmesbury, and he doesn't mention the classical Arthur. And then Henry of Huntingdon, who does a wonderful history of, of England, which is quite comprehensive. He's got a lot of good information in there. It's a very good history book, early 12th century, and he does not mention the classical King Arthur. Um, and so we suddenly don't, we don't get any mention of the classical Arthur until we get to Geoffrey of Monmouth and Walter of Oxford, uh, um, who are, again, early 12th century, about 1135. And suddenly, after all this time, you know, we've, we've already been through 500 years or more, 600 years, and suddenly we get the King Arthur, the full story almost. So why did that happen? How, how did someone suddenly discover the history of King Arthur after all of that time, after 600 years? It's a very Something is wrong with history. Well, yeah, because these writers like Augustine Waddell, who was implying that the, the gods, Thor and Hathor, could have been references to what became King Arthur. So in other words, he was just another living embodiment mm. 
of a superhero or god? Yes, well, that's possible. That is entirely possible because um, the, the the birth scene given by Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, is a very mm, unsatisfactory uh, birth of a you know a national hero. He he's born by deceit with um, with the Pendragon being turned into the likeness of another man so he can sleep with this other man's wife and all of that business, you know, courtesy of Merlin. It's a deeply unsatisfactory birth scene for King Arthur. Uh, and yet we know that that birth scene comes directly from the birth of Hercules. So, yeah, this early few mentions we get of a Dux Bellorum, a, a warlord uh, called Arthur, are simply... Um, uh, a Celtic British version of King of um, uh, of, of Hercules. Um, so yes, in this early rendition of Arthur, we could say that Arthur is a fictional character based upon Hercules, based upon this heroic, semi-divine character called Hercules, and that's why he has these special twelve battles that he's involved in, because these twelve battles are the Twelve Labours of Hercules. It's exactly the same story as Hercules. So all these wonderful historians like um, Guy, 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 somebody, I read his book recently as a part of this, Guy Halsall, who wrote a book of um, Arthurian history, and of course he poo-pooed the whole of it because, you know, Arthur does not exist, he did not find him, it was all fictional. But then he went on to go and find, try and find the Twelve Battles. But of course you can't find the 12 battles because they're just the 12 um, labours of Hercules. They don't exist, they're fictional. Um, so yeah, we've got up to the, the, the 12th century and the entire story so far is all fictional. So how can we get anything historical out of this story? I think at this point, Ralph, it'd be quite good to go into this fairly recent research into the possibility of these two Welsh King Arthurs between 400 and 600 AD. Um, what do you think of this? Is there any possibility that these uh, Welsh kings existed? Th this is Wilson's idea, is it? Yes. Yeah, um, I don't follow that very much at all because um, I, I've, read, I've read his books and I, I, I didn't regard them as, as uh, being very... Um, uh, they weren't very uh, believable. Uh, everything was just assumed, oh, this is Kumru, this is Kumru. Or every inscription around Europe apparently was written in Welsh. And then they were talking about um, this script, which was demonstrably invented in the 18th century, this, this uh, Welsh script, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, and yeah, they, they came across this uh, these two kings from the from the Dark Ages, and this cross that might have had the name of Arthur written on it. But the cross was very atypical. The the script was written uh, incorrectly, so it was not written in proper Latin. Um, the forging of this uh, artifact was very crude and not typical of. Dark Ages uh, metalwork. Um, and even if you thought that this, the, these two Arthurs were, were the Arthur, they are not the classical Arthur. There is no vast court, vast castle, vast kingdom, great wealth, all of the things that go along with the Arthurian story and not anything to do with these two impoverished uh, Welsh uh, princes who may or may not have existed and may or may not have been called Arthur because the names they were given are not exactly the same as Arthur. Um, it is not the Arthurian story, even if you do believe that you know the, these two princes were called Arthur. Um, it doesn't contain any of the elements of Arthurian history. But there is a way of discovering the complete Arthurian story if we look at the era in which this story 
suddenly arrived because it doesn't arrive in this, the fourth and the fifth century when you know Wilson's two Arthurs were supposed to be around. It doesn't arrive until the twelfth century. Why the twelfth century? Because this is the era of the Crusades. So the first Crusade went off in uh, uh, 1096, um, obviously of, uh, to the Near East. Um, and this is just, what, 30, 30 years before Arthurian history came along. And this is the pivotal reason why Arthurian history arrives at this time, because it is dependent on the Crusades. And interestingly, the first crusade, which was led by um, Count Baldwin of Boulogne, uh, did not go to Jerusalem. I mean, the whole idea of the first crusade was to, um, uh, to liberate uh, Jerusalem from Muslim control, but they didn't go there. And it's a, a, a little spoken about thing, but they did a diversion and they ended up going to Edessa instead. So instead of turning right uh, at the northeastern point of the Mediterranean at Antioch, instead of turning right down into the Levant, they carried straight on over the Euphrates and they went to Edessa. Why to Edessa? Well, because the whole of the last interview we did uh, was about Jesus being the king of Edessa. That's why my last book uh, prior to this was called Jesus the King of Edessa. Uh, where is Edessa? It's called San Lurfa now. It used to be the capital of a small principality that was sandwiched between Rome and Parthia. And this little principality was called the uh, Kingdom of, of Osrone. Uh, or the Kingdom of Edessa, or sometimes it was called the Kingdom of Orania, because the queen who set it up was called Thea Musa Orania. She used to be a, a queen of Persia of Egyptian extract, but she was kicked out of Persia in AD 4, and they set up this new principality on the borders of um, Rome and Persia. And Rome accepted them because the whole idea was they would act as a buffer state between Persia and Rome, because there have been many battles uh, between these two empires. And Rome had already lost uh, two entire legions to the Persians. So Rome didn't really want to mess with the Persians too much. And so they set up this principality as a buffer state. And the whole idea of this buffer state was that it would be tax-free. Well, that was in AD 4, that was under Emperor Augustus, but come the sort of late first century under Nero, and they were trying to tax this region. <laughs> and of course, they didn't want to be taxed. And so this whole little revolution, uh, which became the Jewish revolt, revolved around this tax dispute. Um, which is why in the New Testament, of course, you get Jesus saying, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, because it was a tax dispute. Um, and so the Crusaders went to Edessa because they must have known, Count Baldwin must have been related or known somehow about this history, which is hidden now. You know, until I wrote about this in my book, uh, Jesus King of Edessa. This has not been known about, as far as I'm aware, for hundreds and hundreds of years. But Count Baldwin must have known about it, otherwise there would have been no point going across the Euphrates to liberate uh, Edessa from Muslim control. And why liberate Edessa? Well, A, it was the capital city of, of King, King Jesus, King Jesus. But also because Edessa had been separated from uh, the Western Roman Empire. Uh, so there was a, a division between the Eastern Catholic, uh, Catholic Church and the, uh, sorry, the Western Catholic Church and the Eastern uh, sort of Orthodox Church, the Syriac and Armenian churches, at the Council of Chalcedon. And they were totally separated from that time. And then, of course, the Muslim invasions happened in the 8th century. And the whole of that region became totally off limits to anyone in the Byzant uh, Byzantine Empire. And so the Catholic Church could do what it liked with its history and its texts in the West. 
but it had absolutely no control over what the Syriac Christians and the Armenian Christians were writing over in the East. So if there was anything interesting um, over in the East about first century events, about gospel type events, you were going to find it probably in Edessa. And that's exactly where uh, Count Baldwin went to. And of course, Edessa was still a Christian city in that era. It might have been under uh, Muslim control and oppression, but it was still a Christian city. So when Count Baldwin got to Edessa, of course, he was wel welcomed in as a liberating hero. Um, and that became the center of what became called the, the County of Edessa, which sounds nice and sort of um, faintly English, doesn't it? Anyway, that became the County of Edessa. And literally, just a, a decade or so after this, um, now when did they get there? They got there in 1098. So a couple of decades after that, we, we then had the Knights Templar who were formed in 1119. Uh, but they were not ratified uh, as a formal organization by the Catholic Church until 1129. And then they were the Knights Templar, the poor Knights of Christ. And just seven years after that, we then get all of Arthurian history. And those, do those coincident dates are linked, they're causal. Arthurian history came from the Knights Templar. I'm pretty sure about that. And there is so much information and evidence that it is quite clear that Arthurian history came out of the Knights Templar. So what happened is they came back from Edessa, that the first returnees from Edessa were coming back in about, you know, 11, uh, maybe 32, maybe uh, 1130. And they were bringing with them what they had discovered in Edessa. And one of those things that they discovered was a new history of the first century. Uh, what I think they discovered is something like the, um, the history of the kings of Judea by Justus of Tiberius. Now, we don't have this history. We have no idea what it said. But we know it because Josephus Flavius, the first century Jude, uh, Judean uh, historian, uh, is mightily upset by this book and he fulminates against it, saying it was a tissue of lies written by Justus of Tiberius. What he's meaning, of course, is Justus of Tiberius wrote a different history of the first century to the one we have from Josephus. So we have a very biased viewpoint. We have a Roman viewpoint of what happened during the Jewish revolt, courtesy of Josephus Flavius. What we don't have is the opposite view. We don't have the Nazarene view of that revolt, because this was not a Jewish revolt. Everybody calls this the Jewish revolt, which was in AD 68, uh, and it finished in AD 70. But it wasn't the Jewish revolt. This was the Nazarene revolt, the fourth sect of Judaism, as Josephus clearly states in his books. And, of course, who were the Nazarenes? Well, Jesus was. It, it, Jesus was called a Nazarene. And uh, uh, so was Saul, St. Paul. He was called a Nazarene. Um, so the leaders of this revolt are the same people who were involved in gospel New Testament events. They were the Nazarene. And it was this history that found its way back to Europe in 1130, say, AD, just before Arthurian history was written. And where did this history go to? Well, it, uh, uh, Baldwin was the Count of Boulogne. So the history went back to Boulogne. And where did Arthurian history come from? It came from Normandy. So Arthurian history is not British. It was, it was never written by the Britons. Pretty much all of Arthurian history comes out of Normandy and out of Brittany. Um, even people like, you know, uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth was a Norman. He was the son of a commander at the Norman garrison at uh, Monmouth on, on the Welsh borders. But he wasn't, he wasn't Welsh. 
he was from a Norman extract, and that's why he had these uh, manuscripts to work with. Um, and so was uh, Walter of Oxford, because I think Walter of Oxford, Oxford was uh, uh, Walter Cayo, uh, which is a good French name. And um, one of the early manuscripts appears to have come from Walter Cayo, who I think is Walter of Oxford, who wrote the same story as um, Geoffrey of Monmouth does. So this was the beginning of Arthurian history. They had this new manuscript, and this new manuscript from the East was a new history of the first century. Well, more than that, I suppose, it was a new gospel. Because gospel history is just the history of the first century in Judea, of course, in Syria. Uh, and this was a new type of gospel. This was a sort of secular gospel that detailed the history uh, of that region from the Nazarene viewpoint. And, of course, that was a very different viewpoint to the one that was written in the Gospels or the one that was written by Joseph and Flavius. And it was very heretical, quite obviously, from the information within it. It was quite heretical. It would have said, much as I said in my previous book, the Jesus, King of Edessa, it would have said that Jesus was a king, uh, a, a king of northern Syria, that he tried to take over Judea um, during the Jewish revolt. So he was a leader of the Jewish revolt, and he tried to take over the throne of Rome. He tried to become the next emperor of Rome. And listeners might be a bit amazed by that, but we know this because when he was crucified, he was crucified wearing a purple cloak. And a purple cloak is the symbol of the emperor of Rome. There would be no point putting a purple cloak on Jesus when he was crucified if he had not been involved in a revolution to try and become the next emperor. Otherwise, the whole symbology is totally meaningless. So we know he was trying to take over Rome as the next emperor. And we also know that from the star prophecy. The star prophecy was the big prophecy of that era the big Judaic prophecy, uh, which Josephus goes on about quite a lot. And it said that the next emperor of Rome would be a star from the east. And who was born under the eastern star? King Jesus. That's what it says in the New Testament. So we know that Jesus was involved in the Jewish revolt. And this is what this new history would have said. So the Knights Templars came back with this story, and, and uh, it was heretical. And so what Geoffrey of Monmouth and Walter of Oxford have done is they have grafted this story onto British history. They've chosen a king of Britain who had some similarities with the Jesus Judean story, someone who had had a tax dispute with Rome, someone who led a a, uh, an expedition against Rome. And they've grafted this story onto him. Now, that, that particular king, he's not very well known, actually, uh, in British history, uh, was Constantine III. Not the famous Constantine. This is a later Constantine from the beginning of the 5th century, uh, about 410, 4, 407, I think. Um, Which is when the, the Romans had pretty much given up on Britain, really. Pretty much, yes. They, uh, according to my timeline that I'd written, they gave up Britain in 405. Yeah. Um, and two years later, because Britain was not protected by the Romans anymore, they elected this king of Brittany again. So we're going back to this, you know, kings of Brittany, to become the king of, as it were, uh, Britain at that time. And this was Constantine III. And Constantine III was an ex-Roman army commander. And the first thing he did was he gathered an army together and he invaded Rome. And he became the next emperor. So and I, I don't know why this is not taught very well, because I'd never heard of him before I made these investigations. But anyway, he became a very temporary usurper emperor of Rome. And he took over all of France, all of Spain. Um, so he had some similarities with the Judean story in having a dispute and uh, uh, an expedition against Rome. And so what the Templars have done, what uh, Walter 
Oxford and Geoffrey of Monmouth have done is they've grafted this Judean story onto Constantine III and said, this is a British story. But if you look at the history, Tree of Constantine III, the rest of this story that has been grafted on does not match with British history. Um, because it's it's a fic well, it's not fictional. It's a, it's a graft of a, a different history which is being put upon Constantine III. And that became the basis of Geoffrey of Monmouth's uh, book. And essentially this was just carrying on the, the tradition of um, Judaic Pesha in a way, because Judaic Pesha does this all the time. Um, I'm not sure if listeners will be familiar with Pesha, um, but in Judaism, especially in the Talmud, uh, the Talmud was made for, uh, uh, it was a, a history of the laws of um, uh, Judea, but it was also a method of uh, divination of fortune telling. And so in traditional Pesha, you would get um, characters, a, a character, a contemporary character, and compare them with a character in the past. And if they were the same sort of character, you could use the character in the past to predict what would happen in the future with the present contemporary character. That was traditional Pesha. Does that, sorry, but Rob, does that in the Talmud... The the astrological side of it in, in the respect of things like the Shekinah appearing and, and, and different timelines where a new messiah was expected to appear, that sort of thing. Yeah, that is similar in a way. That's different. We'll come on to that in a minute, but that is a slightly different uh, methodology of, of fortune telling. Uh, the main aspect of this one is it was used for covering up who you're talking about. Because it was realized that if you were comparing a contemporary character with a past character, you could actually talk about the past character and pretend it was the real character. So within the Talmud, for instance, um, they call Jesus Balaam. Uh, this is why we know Jesus was a real character, because he's, he's mentioned quite often in the Talmud. And this was written very early. A lot of this is first century stuff. Uh, and they call him Balaam instead. Why? Because Balaam was a character in the Old Testament uh, who was from Babylon, the same as this Jesus character, Jesus, Jesus came from Babylon, um, who was hired by Balak to curse the Israelites. And of course, by starting the Jewish revolt, he was doing the same thing. So they had some similarities. So they called Jesus Balaam. Uh, but then they go on in the Talmud to, to say terrible things about Balaam. Uh, because they didn't like this Jesus character. But nobody would know about it. You know, if there was a Roman looking over their shoulder or a Catholic in later times looking over their shoulder, they wouldn't know that they were talking about Jesus because they've changed the name. And this is effectively what Arthurian history is doing as well. It, does, it uses the same technique. You compare two characters, you call one character another character, and then nobody needs to know you're talking about Jesus and your own fate. You're talking about, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, you're, you're talking about King Arthur when you're really talking about King Jesus. Um, and the reason why he gained that name, of course, is astrological. Now you're coming back to the uh, astrolo astrological side of this. Uh, most of this first century history in Judea is all about astrology, because that was one of the central components uh, of Nazarene religion, was, was the Zodiac. Um, and the same is true of Arthurian history as well. So if, if you imagine a zodiac, um, you have the 12 constellations around the outside, and in the center of the zodiac, you either have the sun, Helios, and that was the Jesus character, this was the, the sun, the son of God. Or, if you look up at the heavens instead, uh, you have the constellations of the, of the northern heavens. And, of course, the main constellation in the center of the north is uh, the great bear, Ursa Major. And King Arthur's name comes from the great bear, Ursa Major. So the two characters that are central to the zodiac are either the, the sun god figure, Helios, or Arthur, the great bear. Um, and that's why you could use 
in Pesha style, you could use the name Arthur and mean Jesus as well. It's just straight Judaic Pesha. It's the same as you see in the Talmud all the way through it. Um, so, yeah, so this is what they've done. They've grafted this history on and used it to tell a different story. <clears throat> That would make um, complete sense. Just before we carry on with this, Ralph, we've covered quite a lot of ground there so far, but what about the Glastonbury myth? Can we just go into that for a short time? Because obviously most of the people who are listening will be aware of that one with King Arthur. Yeah, this is... Um, uh, uh, William of Malmesbury, of course, yeah. Um, but th there is a problem with William of Malmesbury because... William of Malmesbury wrote a chronicle of the English kings in the 12th century, about 1125, about 10 years before Geoffrey of Monmouth. And William of Malmesbury, in that chronicle, does not know the King Arthur. All he's got is, is the one or two bits picked up from Nennius and Bede uh, about some of the other characters, uh, like... Um, uh, Aurelius and so on, and, and, and various of those other aspects, the 12 battles and all of that business. And that's all he's got. So he doesn't mention King Arthur. And suddenly, so and that's 10 years before Geoffrey of Monmouth. And then just after Geoffrey of Monmouth, William of Malmesbury writes his Antiquities of, of Glastonbury, which is the famous one that everybody knows about. And suddenly... Um, Malmesbury knows about King Arthur. So he didn't know anything about it before. He only knows about it after Monmouth has written his book. And then he writes a little bit about uh, King Arthur. But literally, if, if you read uh, uh, Antiquities of Glastonbury, he only, he only writes one, two pages about King Arthur. Uh, this is not the Arthurian story. Um, so... Yeah, the, the history of, um, of King Arthur at Glastonbury is shaky in the, in the extreme because the only pe person who actually uh, narrates this knew nothing about King Arthur when he wrote his first book, even though his first book was a chronicle of the English kings. And, you know, King Arthur is supposed to be the most famous of all the English kings, and he knew nothing about him uh, back in 1125. Um, and then after Malmesbury, of course, uh, we get William of Newburgh, um, who's only just, well, I don't know, 25 years after Malmesbury, about 1160. And um writes, a, again, it's a wonderful history of, uh, it's the history of English affairs, I think it's called. Um, and he berates Geoffrey of Monmouth for writing a complete litany of lies about... King Arthur. And quite rightly, uh, and quite lucidly, he points out that how on earth can we have this famous monarch who's supposed to be more famous than uh, Alexander the Great, more famous than any of the um, Roman emperors, and yet nobody knows about him except, Mon uh, except Monmouth. Well, that's a really and good that, point, because if it was yeah. somebody so historically important, and even as a propaganda tool, he should be mentioned everywhere. Yeah, of course. And um, Newbra doesn't know anything about him. Malmesbury didn't know anything about him uh, prior to his uh, expedition to uh, Glastonbury. Huntington knew no, nothing about him. And the only two people who do are Geoffrey of Monmouth and Walter of Oxford, who are copying from the same manuscript, because they say they're copying from the same manuscript. And that manuscript is not British. The manuscript they're copying is, is from, uh, from Normandy, which they make clear. Um, so, and, and that's why Newborough savages them for creating a litany of lies, because he knows nothing about King Arthur. Um, and he says so, and this is, you know, 1135, and, uh, sorry, 1160, and Newborough is, is adamant that there is no such person as a King Arthur. Uh, so this is why we have this problem with this enormous great gap uh, in Arthurian history. He does not exist for 600 years, and he only exists after the Knights Templar return from Judea. And this is why I've said that um, this story came out of Judea, and the evidence for that 
comes from uh, the next book, the next manuscript after Monmouth. And that's quite often said to be Chrétien uh, of Troy, uh, who wrote Percival. But that is not the original. I'm pretty sure that the original that Chrétien used was high history. Um, and high history, we don't know who wrote high history, but it's a, it's a quite in interesting story. It is obviously exactly the same as Chrétien and almost exactly the same as Wolfram von Eschenbach. Um, but it's a earlier story and it's quite obviously earlier and it's very different. Um, so uh, high history says that King Arthur was the most evil of all kings which again might be a little bit shocking, but there we go. It shows there are two viewpoints to this story. Uh, obviously, there's the one viewpoint that says he's a hero, uh, but high history does not. It says he's an evil king because it's written from a different point of view. And we know why it's written from that point of view, because we have this enormous conundrum at the beginning, beginning of high history, which is also included in the Vulgate cycle as well. Uh, which is that the author, the original, original author of this story was Josephus Flavius. And that's what it says. <laughs> now, you've got to think about that for a minute, you know, because Josephus Flavius uh, was born in AD 37 and he lived in the first century. And yet High History, the original manuscript which was used to create High History, Arthurian legend, was written by Josephus Flavius. How can that be? And of course, you know, historians have looked at this, and uh, my, my favorite horse historians are the Victorians because they are much more knowledgeable than current historians, I can tell you that. And the father of Arthurian uh, research and history is, is William Neitz. Neitz, I think his first name was William. And he obviously comes across this in high history and he all he can say is well obviously there's been a mistake here because uh, Josephus Flavius can't be writing a history about the dark age dark ages in Britain so obviously a mistake has been made here no the mistake is thinking that Arthur is a dark age king if King Arthur was King Jesus then there is no mistake at all. Because all the way through Josephus Flavius books, he writes the whole history of, of Jesus. And we might have to go back a little bit on that because uh, people might be confused about that as well, because they'll say that Josephus Flavius doesn't write about Jesus at all, apart from the two paragraphs that were stuffed in there, uh, which are known as the um, Testimonium Flavium, which are interpolations that were thrown into his books by um, Eusebius. Um, but he does talk about Jesus because all the way through his books, he, he is complaining uh, about having to battle this guy in Judea called Jesus. It's just that, and, and also battle against another guy called Jesus. It's just that nobody previously uh, to my books, because I wrote about this in 97 that with um, Jesus' Last of the Pharaohs, nobody has managed to identify uh, this Jesus from Judea and this King Jesus, again from Judea, as being the biblical Jesus. But once you do that, all of the history fits together. Um, it all matches. You, you can match up all of New Testament history with real events uh, in during the uh, Jewish revolt. That's really so interesting, it, Ralph. Um, yeah. In this last section, because we, we're going to have a, a fairly short interview today, really, which in a way we're giving a very condensed idea here, which is quite a good thing for some people to get into the subject. But in this last section, would you just like to go into the similarities between Jesus and Arthur? Yeah, well, the, the story is the same. Um, so what was King Arthur doing? King Arthur was having a tax dispute with Rome. Um, and of course, 
that could not have happened during the Dark Ages. You know, if you read all, all of these um, uh, manuscripts like uh, Monmouth and Cretien and, and Wolfram, they're all placing King Arthur um, into the early 6th century, uh, early 500s. King Arthur could not have been having a dispute with Rome in the early 500s because the Western Roman Empire had already collapsed by that time. The Western Roman Empire died in, in uh, about 480 AD. There was no Rome to have a tax dispute with. But Jesus, of course, does have a tax dispute with Rome, as we mentioned before. And he was trying to invade Rome. That's why he was crucified wearing a, uh, um, a, a purple cloak. And if you read all of the details uh, about this dispute with Rome, it's quite obvious that they have been copied from Josephus Flavius. So obviously Josephus writes a complete history of the first century and the Jewish revolt. He wrote Jewish War, which is an entire history of that era. And you can pick out paragraphs, pages from Josephus, and find direct equivalents within Arthurian history, especially the, um, the war against King Claudius. And uh, this is in the Vulgate cycle. The Vulgate cycle is, is often missed out um, because it's impenetrable. It's 4,500, sorry, 4,000 pages of Arthurian history written in the uh, 13th century. And it's, it's mind-bogglingly impenetrable. But one of the events that happens uh, throughout this book is that the Arthurian heroes have a battle with King Claudius. And King Claudius is something to do with Rome um, because he is a vassal of Rome. He seems to control the Roman Empire and he's having a battle with, with the uh, Knights of the Round Table. Um, and he's described as being, uh, how do they describe him? As, as being uh, thick, thick set with a, uh, a thick neck and widely spaced eyes and a rotund um, body and etc. Um, a broad face, widely spaced eyes uh, and a large chest. Um, have a look at the uh, statues and the busts we have of uh, Emperor Vespasian. During the Jewish revolt, the, the, the Jewish revolt ended up as a battle between Vespasian and King Jesus, King Jesus of Edessa, King Jesus Manu of Edessa. And this was the Jewish revolt. It was a battle between these two contenders. But it wasn't a, a battle for the, for the throne of Judea. This was a battle for the throne of Rome. Uh, and it was taking place in Judea. Uh, and of course... King Jesus of, of Edessa lost this war, and the winner was Vespasian. And it was Vespasian who went on to become the next emperor. And he is a dead ringer for King Claudius, who was fighting the uh, Knights of the Round Table, both in his, his stature and his looks, and also what he did and the various battles that they had are almost you know, identical copy, copies um, of the events of the Jewish revolt. So it's quite obvious looking at uh, our theory in history that the story is actually about first century history. That's really interesting and you've given very convincing information there. Um, this manuscript that was discovered by the Templars, um, how did you find out about this and where, where do you think it may be now? Well, um, because this is what they say in their books. I mean, they say in High History that High History was copied from a manuscript in the um, 12th century, which was so faint you could hardly read the writing because it was so old. So they're talking about, and if you take it literally, because some people say this is just a literary device, of course, to, to show, you know... Uh, uh, um, authenticity in a, uh, an ancient manuscript. But if you take it at face value, this manuscript they were copying from was very faint and therefore very old. And the manuscript itself says that the original author was Josephus Flavius, first century historian. 
So if, if again, if you take that at face value, this has to be a first century story because Josephus Flavius was a first century character and he was writing not only about Judean history in books that we know from him, these books are saying, and, and it's not just high history, but uh, the Vulgate cycle says exactly the same, that he was also writing Arthurian history. And of course, the main character throughout Arthurian history is Joseph of Arimathea. And you, you, you see the problem here we have in the dating. So you get uh, books like High History that says that Percival was the... Um, Nef great nephew of Joseph of Arimathea. Well, you know, Joseph of Arimathea was a first century character. How does Percival, it means that Percival is a first century character. Um, it says that the father of Percival, who is this Alain Le Gros person I said at the beginning, um, owned the donkey that had belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Now, either you've got a donkey that is 500 years old, <laughs> which is unlikely. Or again, we're talking about first century events. Um, and, and so it goes on. We get this continual confusion between these two eras because mm, I think the authors were a bit lazy, perhaps, and they didn't actually put all of the history back into the first century, which is what they were trying to do. Although in some respects, I think this wasn't just laziness. Some of them were trying to actually demonstrate what this history was really about. Or maybe it was just too, too confusing. So, you know, for instance, we have Sir Galahad, the great Sir Galahad. And he has two fathers. Um, he is either uh, cognate with Percival, so he is Percival. And his father is actually called Lancelot. So he is the son of Lancelot. But there you go, that's what it says. Or he is the son of Joseph of Arimathea. And again, you've got this, this conundrum because, you know, we've got a 500-year gap between the two. And yes, it, it's actually said that, you know, um, uh, Sir Galahad was the son of Joseph of Arimathea. And what they have is these two characters, these two Sir Galahads going off on the same journey but to different places. Um, so the later, as it were, um, character goes off to Palmyra. Well, they call it Saras, but it's obviously Palmyra in Syria because they're on their way to Babylon. Um, and the halfway point between Babylon and, and Jerusalem is, is Palmyra, of course. So it's quite obvious that uh, Saras is Palmyra. That's the city that's just been destroyed, of course, by ISIS. That's right, the Temple um, of Bel. Yeah, uh, yeah, all of that. See, see Palmyra was, is pivotal to this story, which is why I find it's, it's, it's all quite current, because everybody now knows about Palmyra when nobody knew about it when I first went there. Um, the kings of Edessa owned uh, this area called the, the Kingdom of Orania. And it included Edessa, which is now up in uh, Turkey now. It included uh, Amida, which is on the uh, Tigris, which is just sort of to the east of Edessa. And then this same um, empire, as it were, miniature empire, went down to Palmyra and almost down to Damascus. And so Palmyra was their second city. It was probably their most wealthy city. So it was central to this story. And in fact, Arthurian history has a great part in it where it says that the son of Jesus um, was the king of Palmyra. Um, and it does so in Pesha form, of course. It can't say that because that's heretical. You can't say... A, that Jesus had a son and, he, he, and that he was the king of Palmyra. Um, so what it does is it uses Pesha. And this is a lovely piece of it. It's a good way of explaining uh, Pesha, although it's a little bit difficult to do it on the radio. You really need to have a look at the book and have a look at the diagram. Um, so what they do is they call this king of Palmyra um, 
of Palmyra, of Saras, they call him Evelach Mordred. And you remember that the son of um, King Arthur was called Mordred as well. Yes. Uh, this is yeah, this is how they keep linking between the two. So the, the two sons are the same, but they call him Evelach Mordred, and he was the king of Palmyra. Now, that's a nothing name. It, it doesn't mean anything. There is no such king called that uh, from Palmyra or from Syria or from anywhere. And you have to think about this for a minute. Hold on. What are they talking? This is Pasha. Pasha is all about confusing two characters from the current era and from the past in order to cover up who you're talking about. So who were they talking about? Well, they were talking about a Babylonian king called Evil Moradach. You see that this is a, um, a play on words. This is, uh, uh, what do you call it, when you mix up uh, the, the characters in a word? Um, yes. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. You know what I mean. Yes, I do. Uh, instead of Evelach Mordrain, they call him, uh, his real name was Eval Moradach. Yeah. And they've yeah. just swapped over the syllables, basically. It's very, very simple, but it's very effective because nobody has actually seen it before. They, ever since this was written, you know, 800 years ago, nobody has seen this particular um, play on words. And, but why did they call him or name him after Evil Moradach? Because Evil Moradach was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And now you can see why they called him that, because... Nebuchadnezzar was a king who came out of Babylon and destroyed Judea and the Temple of Jerusalem. He was the first king to destroy the Temple of Jerusalem. Yeah. And Jesus, King Jesus of Edessa, was a king who came out of Babylon, because this is where they came from, because his mother and his grandmother had, had been in Persia. They came out of Babylon and started the Jewish revolt and destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem. They did exactly the same. So if you're using Pasha, you can compare these two kings. You can call Jesus uh, Nebuchadnezzar because they have the same history. And therefore, the son of Jesus, you can call the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And the son of Nebuchadnezzar was uh, Evil Moradach, this very same king. And that's why they called the king of Palmyra Evelach Mordred because he was the son of Jesus. Nifty, isn't it? It's and very nobody has seen <laughs> Synonyms. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, not quite synonyms. I'm, I'm thinking it's... Um, uh, where you find another alternative words from another word by mixing up the letters. I'll, I'll remember it in a minute. I don't know why I've forgotten it. Yeah, I've forgotten it as well at the moment because I'm just taking in this vast amount of information. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a vast subject, isn't it? But you see how this works. Yes. Nobody, nobody can actually talk about this. Uh, um, they can't talk about it in, in normal terms because it is heretical. You could not say that, you know, Jesus had a son and he was the king of, of Palmyra. So it has to be covered up somehow. And this is the way they've done it. They've deliberately confused names. Uh, but they've not just chosen any old name, because, I mean, just choosing, you know, Fred Bloggs out of the middle of nowhere is, is meaningless. The whole point of Pasha is that people in the future are supposed to be able to understand what your um, new pseudonyms are and the way you do that is to compare them with people who are similar and that's exactly what they've done all the way through so these are not just made up names that mean nothing these are specific names who are chosen for a specific reason and that is the basis of all of um all of our theory and history um and, and some of these names are because they're all Judaic names, they're all uh, Hebrew. And uh, again, we have these Arthurian authors, modern authors, like Guy Halsall and various other people who have written these um, histories of King Arthur. And they're trying to interpret everything from the Welsh, as, as does Colin Wilson, of course. Everything is, is trying to uh, Alan interpret. Are you talking about Alan Wilson? 
Alan Wilson, yeah, not Gavin. That's right. Yeah. They're very much interested yeah. in their work. It's Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett, and you can find their stuff on YouTube about yes. this this supposed Welsh connection. Um, but he's translating everything from from the Welsh, and of course yes. that's not what it was because. A, because the original manuscripts came out of Normandy and they were written in Norman French and then into uh, Latin, most of them. Um, but all the way through the Vulgate cycle, it clearly states time and time again that all of the proper nouns in the Vulgate cycle are Chaldean, Aramaic, Hebrew. So, and they are. So all of these names are actually Aramaic names. Um, so when you come across things like Excalibur, uh, which is called Caliburn through most of the Vulgate cycle, they call this sword Caliburn. And Calib, in the Aramaic, means sword. It's, that's, that's what it means. So it's not a special name at all. It's just an Aramaic name for a sword. It's called uh, Caliburn. Um, and the same happens with things like um, uh, Sir Galahad. The Galley had in Aramaic, were the high priests of the Galli. And the Galli were the Galileans. You see this connection with New Testament history again, because uh, Jesus was a Galilean, and, and so was um, uh, St. Peter was called a Galilean. Um, but who were the Galileans? They were the eunuch priests um, who were the keepers of the Holy Grail, according to Arthurian history. Um, and, yeah, where does it say this? This is why, of course, Jesus asks for his disciples. And again, this is a part of hidden um, New Testament history, which, again, listeners probably don't know about. Jesus asked for his disciples to become eunuchs. Uh, where's this from? This is from, um, I'm quickly looking it up here, from... Um, I'll find it in a minute anyway, it's in Matthew. Um, and so he asked for his uh, disciples to, to become eunuchs. Why? Because the Galileans, the Galli high priests, were eunuchs, all of them. Um, and this is why Galahad was, got the name uh, Galahad, because his name was not Galahad. He was called um, Percival, and it's quite obvious if you read the old manuscripts and the new manuscripts that Galahad, Sir Galahad, did not exist in the early manuscripts. He only arrives in the later manuscripts where he does, he, he takes over the role of the Percival character. So it's quite obvious that his name was Percival, but then he got a title because a lot of these names are actually titles, and the title they gave him was Galihad, which was the chief of the Galli. He was the high priest, basically, um, of the galley. Um, yeah, uh, I've just come across it. Uh, Jesus and his uh, eunuchs is Matthew 19, 11, where he asks the uh, disciples to become eunuchs. Um, so why was Sir Galahad the high priest of the galley? Well, because we come on to the Holy Grail here. Um, which is a central part of Arthurian history. I'm just going to bring that in, actually, um, even though we probably can't touch on too much of that today. But this really is very important, isn't it? Because from what you've been saying for the last hour, we, and we, we would now know that the Grail story is a Templar story. Yes, and they held the Holy Grail. So this was the two things they brought back from Judea. Um, they brought back this special book, which they, from which they crafted Arthurian history, and they brought back the Holy Grail. Um, and we know this because Wolfram von Eschenbach clearly states that the Knights Templar were the guardians of the Grail. And, of course, in Arthurian history, the guardians of the Grail are the Knights of the Round Table. That's their, their function. So this Holy Grail artifact is a multifaceted art, artifact that, that had several people looking after it. And what is the Grail? Well, on the, the, the first level, it, it's just the chalice that held the blood of Jesus. And so it's, it's something to do with blood and bloodlines, obviously. On the second uh, level, 
of initiation, as it were, into what the Grail was. Um, the, the best explanation, I think, comes from, from Wolfram von Eschenbach, of course, who wrote uh, Parsifal, which is one of the great historian, uh, great histories of uh, Arthurian legend. And he says that uh, Firefitz, who's the brother of Percival, Galahad, uh, was brought to the royal court of King Arthur and brought before the uh, round table because he was going to become one of the Arthurian knights. And so they bring him before the round table and the grail princess comes out and with holding the grail, because that's what the grail, the grail was always held by a grail princess. And the function of the grail was it came out and it fed the knights of the round table. But in New Testament history, when it says feed, it often me means feeding knowledge, yes. not feeding food. Anyway, so th this princess comes out and she stands before Firefitz and the knights say to Firefitz, can you see the grail? And he says, uh, he's, he's sort of looking left, he's looking right, and he's, um, no, I can't see the grail. All I can see is this princess holding a green cloth. And of course, all the knights roll around in, in, in laughter, um, because this is one of the initiations into what the grail is. He can't see the grail, not because he can't see it, because he doesn't know what the grail is. And quite obviously, the grail is the princess. That's why he can't, because he's looking for the wrong thing. The grail is the princess. Why is the grail a princess? Because the chalice of the royal blood is her womb. That is the Holy Grail, is her womb. And it holds the, um, the next generation of the Grail royal family. Because in the next part of the facets of the Holy Grail, Wolfram von Eschenbach clearly states that the Holy Grail was a meteorite. It was a stone. Like the Benben stone. It was the Benben stone, the very one yes. and the very same. And Which it is was the brought to Earth. Know it was meant to be the capstone to the Great Pyramid. Yes, it could well have been, but it ended up at Heliopolis, and it was yes. on a, um, a a plinth at Heliopolis at one point before it disappeared. It was rumoured to be taken to the Kaaba by Abraham, which, which is why they've got the sacred stones in the Kaaba in uh, Mecca, of course. Um, but they are only little crumbly little bits. They're not the proper um, Grail stone. So Wolfram von Eschenbach says that the Holy Grail, which he calls the Lapsit Elixis, which means the, the, the stone from heaven, the stone that has fallen from heaven, which is a fairly good description um, of a meteorite, was brought to earth by aliens, which is what he said. You can make of that what you will, um, and given to a royal family to look after. And of course, this stone required a princess to tend to it. It required a cadre of knights, which were the knights of the round table, to protect it. That was the whole function of the, the knights of the round table. And it required a priest to venerate it. And the priest who venerated it was the galley high priest. It was Sir Galihad. That was his official function. Um, and in biblical history, he was St. Peter. That's why, uh, because St. Peter wasn't called St. Peter. His name was Simon. But he was given the title, again, all of these names are titles. He was given the title Peter Kephas. And Peter Kephas means stone, stone. It's quite obvious that, that St. Peter became the holder of the grail stone. That's why he was given the name Peter. And so he's the direct equivalent of Sir Galahad, who was also, at the same era, uh, made the galley had the high priest of the galleys. Um, but if he was the galley had, the high priest of the galley, he had to be a eunuch. Because all of the high priests of, of the galley high priests were always eunuchs. Uh, and this is why we come into Arthurian history, the... Uh, king who looks after the Holy Grail is always called the Wounded King, 
So we have two main kings, the fisher king and the wounded king. The fisher king is the Jesus character because he was the fisher of men. And the wounded king was the eunuch because it's pointedly said that the, the wounded king was wounded by a sword or a spear being thrust through his loins, which quite obviously means his genital. Yeah. And that's how he became the wounded king. And so he was a eunuch. He was a galley. He was a galley head. And so Sir Galahad would have been a eunuch. And we have a wonderful um, description of, of the galley. Um, because these are real characters. I mean, this is from real history. This is not made up from Arthurian history. This is part of real Roman history. And we, we have a quote from Lucian, Roman historian, uh, about the galleys. And he says, on these days the galley are made. That's the, the galley priests. Uh, while the rest are playing flutes and performing rites, a frenzy comes upon many of them, and he throws off his clothes and rushes to the centre with a great shout, and he takes up his sword, and he immediately castrates himself. And then the galley rushes through the city holding these testicles, uh, and he takes female clothing and women's adornments from whatever house he throws these testicles into. Um, so this is how the galley festival um, w was uh, was organized. So uh, they had a big festival and the, 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 the next chosen high priest um, and probably some of the lower priests as well, if they wanted to become galley priests, they had to castrate themselves. That was one of the requirements, um, which was totally against Roman law, of course. This is why the Rome was having a dispute with these people, because castration was, uh, was forbidden within Rome. Um, so Sir so Galahad would have worn uh, women's clothing and women's uh, uh, makeup. Uh, and not only that, he would have worn a uh, red, red dress as well, because uh, that's what it says in Arthurian history. He always wore red. And you might think, oh, this is a bit crazy. You know, this is supposed to be, <laughs> this is supposed to be Sir Galahad, you know, the gallant knight sitting on a, on a horse um, wearing a red dress. But, of course, this is exactly what happens, even today. If you go to Rome, if you go to St. Peter's, and you go to one of the great festivals there, you will see bishops arriving from all over the world wearing red dresses, exactly the same as Galahad did. Um, so the same tradition exists even today. And... And, but again, you might think, oh, hold on a minute, you know, the, the, Sir Galahad wasn't just a bishop, he was a, he was a knight on, in shining armour, you know, he was killing his enemies. It doesn't, it doesn't gel with Arthurian history. But it does, because we have a complete quote about the galley uh, priests from Josephus Flavius. And again, this is back to the same era we were talking about before. This is the Jewish revolt. This is the first century. And these were the leaders of the Jewish revolt. And the leaders of the Jewish revolt, who I said before, was King Jesus Manu of Edessa, who was the biblical Jesus. Uh, but Joseph, Josephus calls them the Galileans. And of course, Jesus was a Galilean. Uh, he was called a Galilean in Matthew uh, 26, 69. Um, and also in Luke 23, 26, where Jesus is called a Galilean. And so was St. Peter. He was a Galilean in Luke uh, 22, 59. Um, so Josephus has this description of the Galileans, the Galli high priests. And he says, um, these Galileans, they indulged themselves in feminine wantonness. They decked their hair and put on women's clothing. And they smeared... Um, themselves with ointments that they may appear very comely and they had paints under their eyes and imitated not only the ornaments but also the lusts of women but while their faces looked like the faces of women and they kill uh, sorry but while their faces looked like the faces of women they killed with their right hands and while their gait was effeminate they attacked men and became warriors and drew their swords from under their finely dyed cloaks and ran everybody through that they came upon uh, that they came upon uh, that's from josephus flavius um, so you can see that 
the galley high priests and the role of a gallant knight are compatible. They're one and the same. So it would be like a, uh, a bishop today having a, a sword under his cassock and taking his sword out and running his enemies through with his sword. And this is what Arthurian history was talking about. And again, you couldn't, you couldn't talk about this in, in the Roman era. You couldn't really talk about it in the um, Arthurian era, the, the, the sort of 12th century era, because all of this was taboo. Um, well, I think you amongst know, the people who are really bought into the Arthur myth, it would be taboo to them as well, even today. Oh, it is. It is. And uh, I get a lot of resistance, uh, probably more resistance uh, about my writing about King Arthur than when I wrote about King Jesus, um, because people are a little bit flexible on Jesus nowadays. He doesn't have to be, you know, a pauper prince of peace. We can bend the rules a little bit with Jesus, and I sort of get away with it, although, you know, some fundamentalists are a little bit upset. But when it comes on to Arthurian history, people get very upset. I know? think that's because it's it's so mythic. Um, with, with Jesus, obviously, there's stuff there that people can latch into. So it goes beyond the any, any of the historical kind of conflicts in the story. They, they can go to the text. But with Arthur, they can't do that, can they? Yeah, also, though, it's it's more a, a, a mindset. You know, if I'd yes. been saying these things about Jesus 100 years ago, 200 years ago, people would have been very upset by it because they were into the Jesus story. It was a part of their life. It was They understood it all to be true, and therefore someone saying it was something completely different um, would be completely heretical and, and uh, would, would be attacked in the streets. Um, that's no longer true with, with Christian history because people are no longer attached to it in quite the same respect. But they are still attached, very much so, to Arthurian history. It's still a part of their culture, um, their belief in where they came from, their identity. And to have that challenged is, is uh, very challenging for some people. And so, yes, this does not go down well in some quarters that I'm changing our theory in history, even though my new history actually makes a lot more sense than the old history, because I can explain everything that happened within our theory in history. I can explain why there is no archaeology. I can explain why there is no literary evidence of uh, Arthur for five, six hundred years. All of that can be explained, but it can't be explained in in the old traditional sense. And it'll, it'll take a while for people to get used to this, um, but I think they eventually will, but it's, it's, it's going to be a long time uh, coming before they get there. Um, I mean, for instance, um, I, I can explain things like, uh, I mean, this is a this comes from uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth, and it shows you how Arthurian history has been bent and warped to fit another story into it. Um, so after the death of Arthur, about four generations after the death of Arthur, Geoffrey of Monmouth says that there was an African army, 160,000 strong, in Ireland that sailed to Britain to take over Britain. And you've got to think about that for a minute. Hold on. An, Af an army from a Africa in Ireland attacking Britain in, in the 7th century? Uh, where did that come from? Um, so, again, we have to interpret this. You know, our theory in history cannot be taken on the level. You have to use a bit of interpretation. And... It was obvious to me because I've been looking into this. It's not been, I think, obvious to anyone else. I've, I've not seen anyone else who's actually understood what this is all about. But anyway, I knew what this was because I'd already written my book, uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, Princess of Orange, which was all about Mary Magdalene in uh, the south of France. And it turned into a story which was all about the princes of Orange who came from the south of France. Anyway... Monmouth goes on to say that the leaders of this African army in Ireland were Gormand and Isambard. Uh, 
Well, that was a, a, a spark for me because I knew exactly who Gormand and Isambard were. Um, Gormand and Isambard were the leaders. Um, well, Gordon, Gormand and Isambard is a French chanson, one of the troubadour songs um, from the 13th century. And they wrote all of these troubadour songs about the Muslim invasion. Uh, well, this one was about the Muslim invasion of the south of France and Spain. And the story is called Gormand and Isambard. So it's quite obvious that this uh, African army in Ireland is actually the African, the Muslim army that was in Spain that came and attacked um, France and invaded France. And if you remember, they were pushed back by uh, uh, Charles Martel, first yes. of all. And then they were pushed back, but then they came back in again in the um, uh, late 8th century. And then the prince who fought them and, and sent them back to Spain was William of Orange, the very same person that I'd been writing about in my book, Mary Magdalene, Prince, Princess of Orange. And... So this is what this story that Monmouth was talking about. And we know this is connected to Arthurian history because the person who wrote about William of Orange was uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach. And the other um, book that Wolfram wrote was Parsifal his Arthurian history. So Wolfram wrote about Arthurian history and about the invasion by Gormand and Isambard um, during the uh, 8th century, the invasion of the Muslims into France. And so they mesh together. The same authors are writing the same story, both with, uh, with, with um, Wolfram and also with Monmouth. They're writing the same story. And so Monmouth has taken this story, and he's, he's before Wolfram was born, of course, so this is quite early, and he's taken this story, and he's, he's sort of molded it into his Arthurian history. So it is real history, but you've got to sort of work out what it is. And then it also shows that um, uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach was not writing this himself, he was borrowing from the same sources, because he's using the same source, obviously, that Monmouth had been using 100 years prior to him. And they're all using the same original source text. Unfortunately, we don't have the original source text, but all we have is these interpretations of them by these various Arthurian authors. So that sort of just goes to show how fluid this Arthurian history is. Um, he's talking about King Arthur of Britain, and they're bringing in the whole of the 8th century invasion of, of France by the, by the African Muslims into this same story and using it as, as, as a part of his narrative. Um, why is he doing that? Because half of this is propaganda. You, you've got to think about when Monmouth was writing this story. He was writing this story uh, in the early 12th century, just as the Crusades were starting. And this is, in effect, it's a call to arms. You've got to protect your lands just like um, Charles Martel was doing, just like William of Orange was doing in France, and just like, like King Arthur was doing in Arthurian times. You've got to be the Arthurian hero and go off and protect uh, Christendom uh, from the Muslim invasions. So effectively, this, this was half propaganda. It wasn't just, just a story about King Arthur. It was propaganda about the Crusades. Go on the crusade and save Christendom. Um, this was a part of the reason why they were writing it. Well, that's great. And a probably a good place to leave it for today. And I think everybody now is used to propaganda. Um, we, <laughs> we get it every day of the week and from every possible source imaginable. Um, but that's been really fascinating, Ralph. Just a, a, one last question. The connection between Jesus and Britain is made in your book, Jesus, King of Edessa. And you state in there that there's a good chance, um, according to your research, that Jesus was actually buried in Chester. Yes, 
Is yeah. there any uh, parallel? Uh, uh, this, Go on. With, with Arthur, yes, of course. Uh, there is, because we, we get this pointing in two different directions within Arthurian history. One part of this history is saying that Galahad went to Saras, which is Palmyra, in Syria. And the other part of this same story is saying he went to the west, to the far regions of the west, which is where Avalon is, of course. And it's quite obvious that they're pointing there towards Britain because they say they went to Gales uh, or Hoselis, which is supposed to be Wales because Wales in the Latin is called Gales. Yes. Why is Wales called Hoselis, um, Gales? Because I think it comes from Arthurian history. So I've, I've been trying to look into the history of when Wales was called Wales, and it doesn't seem to be called Wales before the sort of 11th century. Um, Arthurian history says that Wales was actually called Hoselis, and Hoselis in Aramaic means eunuch, the same as Saras and Palmyra does. And I think one of the other names that was given to it, because it says that after Sir Galahad became the king of Wales, it was then called Gales or Wales. Um, and it was called that because the name Gales means eunuch. So both Hoselis and Gales or Wales both mean eunuch. So it was the land of the eunuchs. It was where Sir Galahad went to. Uh, now, one half of the story is saying that that land was over in Syria, it was Palmyra, and the other half of the story is saying it was over in Britain, it was Wales. And why are they doing that? Well, because after the Jewish revolt, Rome did not know what to do with these rebels that it had captured. And it, 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 Josephus clearly states that the uh, King Jesus uh, of Edessa was captured. What they wanted to do is take... Um, this King Jesus as far from his power base as they possibly can and as far as you possibly can from Judea within the Roman Empire was England at the time um, and so they built this fortress over in Chester uh, which was effectively it was just a huge great Guantanamo Bay uh, for these dangerous rebels so you know <laughs> History is always repeating itself, you know. I, I don't know whether they took their cue from this, but, but anyway, they've done exactly the same in the modern era by building Guantanamo Bay as far as they could, as it were, from America while still <laughs> keeping control of it. And the Romans did exactly the same. And so these rebels ended up in Chester in England in this prison fortress. And the question then becomes, what do you do with these rebels when they expire? because they were never going to get out of there, that was for sure. This was a, a life imprisonment. But what do you do with their remains when they expire? Um, well, at the time, I was saying that he was probably bought, buried in, in Chester to keep his remains as far as you could possibly get from, from Judea. Uh, Arthurian history gives a slightly different uh, slant to that, because Geoffrey of Monmouth says that um, uh, Arthur's father and Arthur's son were both buried at Stonehenge. And I sort of sat and thought about that for a minute, and it, it sounded quite reasonable in a way, because if you're thinking about the same scenario, you've got these people, dangerous rebels who have died um, in Britain. You don't want their remains going back to Judea. Uh, where can you put them that will keep everybody happy? Because the supporters of these um, these rebels were very powerful still, very influential. They didn't want to upset them too much, which is why they hadn't been killed in the first place. That's why they were imprisoned. So you want to handle their remains with a degree of sort of respect, but you don't want them to go back to Judea, where they can be used as the focus for a, uh, a further revolt. Uh, so, well, what about Stonehenge? Well, Stonehenge would have been abandoned at the time, because you remember the Romans had just wiped out the Druids in Anglesey in the 8060s, just before yes. the Battle of Watling Street. And so at the time, um, Stonehenge would have been abandoned. Now, wouldn't that be a reasonable place to put the remains of these rebels that would keep everybody happy? It just struck me that that would be 
a, a reasonable thing to do. And so I think that's probably what happened because we know there are lots of Roman diggings around Stonehenge. I mean, they've been doing some archaeology recently there. And half of the um, remains they're coming out with are intrusive Roman burials. and Well, not burials so much of people, but Roman artifacts uh, on the Stonehenge site. So it just struck me that that would be a reasonable thing to do, especially since Monmouth says that is possibly what happened. And so for many reasons, at the end of my book, I end up with saying that um, Avalon may well be Stonehenge. Well, that's a really fascinating place to leave it. And you've brought some very compelling information there. I've been quite riveted by it all, having looked into different scenarios of the Arthur story. And that's certainly one of the most detailed expositions I've ever heard. And so I'd recommend people get your book. Where can they get your book, Ralph? Yeah, this is the, the Grail Cipher. So we, we started this with the um, King Jesus trilogy, which was uh, Cleopatra to Christ, King Jesus, Jesus, King of Edessa. And then it sort of grew. So the, the trilogy is now in four parts, as it were. And the latest one was um, uh, the Grail Cipher, which is the Arthurian book. Uh, it's quite large. It's 640 pages or something. Um, Best look for information on my website, which is edfu-books.com, which is edfu-books.com. They're all on, obviously, on the Amazon. The books are there. Also, the um, the tablet versions there, and I, I I tend to prefer the tablet versions nowadays. The advantage with the tablet ones is they're all in color because it's very easy to do now with um, with with tablets, whereas the paperbacks are by necessity nowadays are, are black and white um, and also you have the search functions on the tablets as well so I tend to prefer the um, tablet version anyway they're all on um, uh, Amazon if you're in the States you can also get them from Adventures Unlimited so that's another source um, and yes have a read it's uh, intensive it's all factual historical i don't use any non-historical texts so it's all from the original texts um, I, I i tend to not use other people who have interpreted arthurian history as my basis for my research i use my own research so it's all from original texts uh, and whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, there will be a lot of new material because I go through the books that nobody else goes through. Um, I've been through a lot of these Arthur in histories looking at other people's works and nobody bothers with the Vulgate cycle. And yet the Vulgate is the biggest corpus of Arthur in history that was ever written. Um, and so if you're writing about Arthur in history without using the Vulgate, uh, it's it's um, a bit like writing a history of the New Testament without using the Gospels. Uh, uh, I mean, it's just poor research. Um, but I wouldn't recommend uh, reading the Vulgate because it's utterly impenetrable. If if readers want to, if listeners want to have a a, a look at the original source te text, um, by the Merlin Grail, it's called by Robert de Boron, and Robert de Boron wrote or was the translator of the Vulgate cycle. But he also wrote Merlin Grail, which is like a 150 page summary of the entire Vulgate cycle. And it's very easy to read. It's very good. And it gives you a good idea about what the Vulgate talks about and how different it is to normal Arthurian history. Um, so, yeah, I hope uh, listeners enjoyed that. And um, maybe we can do some questions and answers later. That would be great, Ralph. We'll have you on the show again very soon. Uh, that's Ralph Ellis, and it's good night from Windows on the World. We'll see you soon.